Hello everybody. Today we're going to be talking about the time that the CIA faked a vampire attack in order to take over the Philippines. Yeah. Several of my videos discussing weird historic events can be qualified as conspiracy theories, or at least conspiracy adjacent, but this one has been documented by government accounts, several journalists, people who were there and affected by it, as well as the people who organized it themselves, so pretty straightforward. After World War II, the American government was concerned with communist influence in Southeast Asia. In order to establish power within Southeast Asia, the American government began commandeering several countries in the region. Among their places of concern was the area of central Luzon, Philippines. However, in the late 40s and early 50s, there was a local rebellion taking place within the Philippines that the government would have to quell in order to establish dominance in the region. So, in 1950, Lieutenant Colonel Edward Lansdale was sent to the region in order to stop the rebellion by any means necessary. Since the rebel forces were composed of a guerrilla army, direct force didn't seem to work. So instead, Lansdale moved to psychological operations. And among those operations, as we'll talk about, were vampires. The story and a lot of the conspiracies around it run deeper than just hoo-hoo ha-ha vampire attack, but we'll also get to the hoo-hoo ha-ha vampire attack, so don't worry. But you'll see how a vampire attack in the Philippines connects to the Kennedy assassination and also sabotaged condoms. I'm not kidding. As soon as I heard about this story, I had to immediately tell somebody about it. I mean, it's too weird not to. And as we move into the spooky season, I think this is a pretty good topic to bring up. So if that sounds interesting to you, stick around as we talk about the time that the CIA pretended to be vampires. This is my life now. And while we're talking about the spooky season, let's talk about the scariest thing of all. Having your personal data stolen while you browse the internet. But fear no more thanks to today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN is the digital tool that keeps your information secure whenever you're online. Whenever you browse the internet while using Atlas, Atlas will mask your personal information, so if anyone or anything tries to get information from you, they'll be stopped by Atlas's system. Atlas also features a series of user-friendly tools, like for example their data breach monitor, that you can use to check to see if your email or password have been a part of any leaks. So rather than just being afraid that your information's out there, now you can know for sure. You can also use Atlas to change your digital location. Say for example you want to watch a movie on Netflix, but that movie is only available in a different region's version of Netflix. All you have to do is change your location to that region, and you will now have access to their entire catalog of movies and TV shows. Atlas VPN is also offered on all devices, and if you're going to browse the internet, then why not be smart about it? And now is the perfect time to hop on board. And that's because if you go to the link in the description at atlasv.pn forward slash windagoon, you will be able to get a three-year subscription to Atlas for $1.99 a month. That is right, just go to the link in the description, atlasv.pn forward slash windagoon, to get three years for $1.99 and a 30-day money-back guarantee if you're not happy with it, although I'm sure you'll love it. This isn't a deal you want to miss out on. Thank you all so much for watching the ad, and thank you so much to Atlas for sponsoring this video. It really does mean the most. Hope you all check them out. Link is in the description, and we are back to the video. We are going to go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. Now, the Philippines' relation with the United States has always been messy, but for the sake of this video, we're just going to look at World War II onwards. During the beginning of World War II, the majority of the Philippines were captured by the Japanese military. As soon as the imperial military had taken over the Philippines, they began to use its people and resources for the war effort. And not only did the people of the Philippines have things like their food and farms stolen by the Japanese, but in some cases, the military would even begin to steal their women and children. So, as you can imagine, several of the Philippine people began to fight back. The primary group of Philippine freedom fighters were known as the Huk Balahop. The Huk Balahop, also known as the Huk Rebellion, is an acronym that translates to the People's Anti-Japanese Army. During the war, the Americans would use the help of the Huks in order to destroy the Japanese holdouts that were within the Philippines. And as the Japanese began to clear out of the region, the Americans would begin to enlist the help of Filipino businessmen and elected leaders. However, this is where the problems begin. 
So during the beginning of World War II, before America got involved and Japan was taking over the Philippine Islands, several of the businessmen and politicians tried to earn the favor of the Japanese so that they would have a more favorable outcome as the war progressed. So in the first years of the war, several of these leaders and landlords had allied themselves to the Japanese and would not only feed and house them, but give them advice about fighting their own people who were in the people's anti-Japanese army. So at the end of the war, whenever the U.S. government was trying to reinstitute the Filipino government, and they did it using the pre-existing leaders of the Philippines, that doesn't go over well with the people who have been fighting them for the past four years, as you could imagine. Because several of these leaders had helped the Japanese destroy their country, and then America comes in and says, yeah, these guys are still in charge. And while tensions were high, there was no direct violence, at least until 1946, when the leader of the PKM, a group that the Hucks were allied to, was murdered, then they decided to get violent again. They changed their name from the People's Anti-Japanese Army to the People's Liberation Army, but still went by the name of Huck. And as America was trying to make a new government for the Philippines, the Hucks would smuggle weapons into the mountainside and begin to grow local resistance. It also didn't help the government's case that these local leaders who had previously had to do things under the watchful eye of the Japanese military were now pretty much given free reign by the Americans. So as soon as these leaders got power, they began to take a bunch of the food and resources from farmers and essentially just be a jerk to the peasant class that they didn't care for which helped to increase support for the opposing Huck Rebellion. And by 1949, it's estimated that the Hucks had anywhere from 11,000 to 15,000 active fighters. A couple things to note with this is, for one, whenever you read about the Hucks in American or pretty much any official history text, they're kind of just called an offshoot of the Soviet Union and a directly communist strong arm of theirs in the Philippines because during that time of the Cold War, the concern was between American capitalism and Russian communism. So anytime there was any problem or enemy that came up against America, they'd say, oh, well, they're just in league with the communists. And because of that, the Hucks have gone down in history as a communist fighters group. And while the Hucks were allies with the PKP, who was a group of fighters who were a part of the Soviet Union, all of the Huck fighters were like farmers who just didn't like having their stuff stolen. So while you could maybe argue that kind of was in line with some of the beliefs, they just didn't want to get pushed around. So calling them a Soviet Union military organization is exaggeration at best. I should also mention that while everything I've said until this point paints the Hucks out to be just like these valiant freedom fighters fighting against the government, and while there were certainly elements of that, by 1949, the movement had become large enough that people would claim the name of the Huck Rebellion so that they could get away with things like murder and robbery. So while there definitely was a good cause, at least in the beginning, by 1949-1950, the Hucks were seen as a bunch of rampant pillagers at least around heavily populated areas. In the mountainside where the original Huck rebels were, there was more of a grassroots movement to help them, but that dissonance can't last long. Government is not being good to its people, and some of the people are acting a fool. Now, did the United States government care about this? No. They were concerned with the Russian threat, and everything they did was to advance that end, as we're going to see. So if America is going to have a position of power in the Philippines, which is a very strategic location for anything in Southeast Asia, then they're going to have to deal with this local infighting. So in 1950, the Pentagon sent one of their best men to the Philippines, Lieutenant Colonel Edward Lansdale. Now, if you're weird like I am and into crazy Cold War PSYOP stuff, Lansdale is a very familiar name. He wrote the book for what would become the majority of PSYOP tactics from Vietnam forward. He's also very instrumental in a lot of special forces training and tactics and adventures that they would go on later. And he was actually one of the founding members of the CIA. Before World War II, when he would join the military, Lansdale was an advertising executive in San Francisco. From that job, he developed knowledge as to how people's minds work and how to convince them of what you want them to think. 
So whenever he joined the military during World War II, he was sent to the Operation of Strategic Services, or the OSS, which after the war, the members of it created the Central Intelligence Agency, or the CIA. So Lansdale, one of the first ever CIA agents, gets to the Philippines in 1950 and creates something called the Civil Affairs Office. The Civil Affairs Office was a means for Lansdale to communicate with Filipino leaders of how they can best destroy the Filipino rebellion. As an expert in psychological warfare, Lansdale said that the best way to convince a people of what you want them to think is by using their own truths and ideas against them. So after analyzing the situation and speaking with other leaders, Lansdale determined that the majority of Filipino people were very superstitious and had a lot of religious beliefs tied to local tradition. So he decided that that is how he's going to get them. The first of these operations went as follows. On a cloudy day, he had someone fly a small airplane with a very large speaker attached to it. This airplane flew over the Philippine countryside where it was believed that several of the locals were aiding and embedding Huck rebels. And from this large speaker flying through the clouds played several curses in the locals' native language. These messages said that any collaborators who are helping the local rebels will have their family cursed and all of their belongings destroyed if they continue to aid them. And it seems that this worked, as in the following weeks, several groups of Huck rebels turned themselves into the authorities because they were starving. See, typically with these guerrilla factions, they have to rely on the goodwill of others and create this underground network of supplies and shelter in order to sustain themselves. But now that these people were afraid of a curse and kicked them out, they had no other option but to turn themselves in or starve to death. So seeing that this was working, Lansdale doubled down. Lansdale had several men embedded into the local population in order to give him information as to where the Hucks were or what they were doing. So using this information, Lansdale began to get data on which specific houses were aiding the rebels. Then, under the cover of night, his agents would go out next to these houses and spray paint these large watching eyes on the streets around these houses. So imagine that you are a local person who is invading a group of rebels, and while you're supportive to their cause, you also have yourself and your family to look out for. And then one day you go to bed, and when you wake up, there are eyes painted all around your house. Would probably make you think twice about helping these guys out. So because of this, collaborators became more few and far between, and the Huck rebels had to more so rely on their own resources. And now that we've set the stage for all that, let's talk about the vampires. Now the term vampire is a bit of an oversimplification of what actually happened. The Filipino people have a legend of a creature known as an Oswang. Oswang itself is kind of an overarching term that can embody ideas from witchcraft to zombie-like risen dead people to demonic spirits or what have you. But the commonality seen throughout Oswang belief is that they are a blood-sucking creature who drains the blood of their victims. Most often through a long tongue that shoots out and stabs people kind of like a mosquito. So Lansdale, having seen that flying a plane and pretending to be God worked, maybe they should try the vampire thing. Specifically, there was a mountaintop in central Luzon that was a strategic control point for the Huck rebels. And Lansdale decided to literally scare them out. So he had a couple of his men go to the villages around the mountain and begin talking of how they saw an aswang on the mountain nights prior. Sure enough, other rebels said that within the day, people in the town began to tell stories of how there is an aswang or demonic creature draining the blood of people in the forest around the mountain. So Lansdale waited a couple days, at which point he was sure that the information got back to the Huck rebels directly, and then decided to send a group to attack. So a couple nights after this story's been floating around, there is a group of Huck rebels on top of the mountain doing a patrol around the trails along the top of the mountain itself. And as they're patrolling, this group of hitmen sneak up on them. Whenever the patrol has their guard down, they grab the guy in the back of the patrol and drag him into the bushes. Once they've got a hold of him, they kill him and take two small puncturing devices. I'm not sure if it was like a screwdriver or what, but they put two holes into his neck and hung him upside down to drain all the blood from his body. 
Then once that's done, they threw his body back onto the trail where he went missing so that whenever his guys come looking for him, they find his body drained of blood with two puncture holes in the neck. So yes, with no exaggeration, straight from their own admittance and declassified records, the CIA staged a vampire attack on this random Filipino freedom fighter. And, perhaps even more surprisingly, it worked. The next day, the entire rebel force cleared off of the mountain. Now, is this because they thought that an Aswang was attacking them and may kill their entire camp? Possibly. But also, like, if I was with a group of friends and we were camping on a mountain and we thought that one of us had been killed by a vampire, we would probably leave. But if I was with a group of friends on top of the mountain and we thought that some random dude killed our friend and staged it to look like a vampire, we would also probably leave. <laughs> and yeah, it can be safely assumed that at least some people thought it was an Oswang. At the same time, a lot of people probably thought that it was the CIA killing them and draining their blood, which is also a pretty good reason to get out of there. From here, psychological operations continued in the Philippines for some time to come. And while everyone likes to remember the flying plane threatening curses at people and the giant eyes and obviously the vampire attack, there were a lot of other psychological operations that had the same, if not greater, effect. For example, Lansdale began a radio show that people in the mountains for the first time could hear directly from their leaders how they're trying to rebuild the country. Lansdale made sure that government officials were no longer being abusive to the locals, which, again, if the locals feel like they're not being oppressed, they don't really have the need to support a group of freedom fighters. And several government leaders would dress up and pretend to be Huck rebels and go through villages stealing food and yelling at people. So as villagers began to think that the government was beginning to have their best interests and be supportive while the Hucks were murdering people and acting like jerks, half legitimate, half government officials dressed up as Huck rebels, then support for the Huck rebellion began to die out. It was also about this time, again around 1953, that the Filipino government was like, wow, Thanks, America. We sure are glad you helped us out with those rebels. You can go ahead and leave whenever you want. And the CIA was like, yeah, leave. While Lansdale was there, he became friends with someone known as Raymond Magsese. During Lansdale's operations in the country, Raymond was the head of their Department of Defense. And Raymond aided Lansdale in his operations in the Philippines. So the two became friends whenever Lansdale was doing his operations. And around 1952, he says, hey, Raymond, why don't you, uh, why don't you run for president? And Raymond says it's a great idea and begins to run. But as soon as he does, he quickly realizes that it's not him running for president, it's the CIA running for president. Raymond was used as a puppet, and everything from his speeches to his policies were decided by the U.S. government. To ensure Raymond's election, the CIA began running smear campaigns against all of Raymond's opponents. Everything from rumors in the paper to spiking their drinks before they gave a speech in order to make them look unfavorable to the public. One day, before he gave a speech, Raymond suggested that perhaps this time, instead of Lansdale and the CIA giving him a speech, maybe Raymond could write his own speech or have one of the locals help him write his speech. And Lansdale got so mad that he began to hit Raymond to the point that Raymond was knocked out. By the time Raymond was elected in 1953, he was so battered and scared of the U.S. government that he sent a message directly to President Eisenhower that said, I will do whatever the United States wants me to do, even if my people disagree with it. Also from declassified reports, whenever the day of the election came and Raymond was elected, it turns out the CIA had illegally smuggled guns into the country and hidden them around the city so that if he wasn't elected, they could stage a coup. In 1957, he even passed a new law that said the Philippines will never <laughs> accept any form of communism as it, quote, puts us under the control and domination of an alien power. And, you know, we, we wouldn't want that now, would we? Raymond died in a plane crash in 1957, and immediately the CIA had a new puppet that they wanted to run. And one of the opponents of the CIA, who was also running at the time, was named Claro Recto. 
And initially, the CIA just wanted to kill him, but then decided they couldn't for logistic purposes. So as part of their smear campaign against him, they began to leave these packages of condoms all over populated areas that said they were from Claro Recto, but in the top of all of them was a very visible hole poke so that the people would think this guy running for office wants to sabotage their love life for some reason. In May of 1954, the leader of the Huck Rebels, Louis Tarouk, would turn himself into the authorities and surprisingly only got 15 years in jail, which I would assume they'd just kill him. But with Tarouk turning himself in, a lot of people considered 1954 to be the official end of the Hucks. Lansdale was shortly thereafter transferred to Vietnam, even though we weren't officially there yet. And from there, Lansdale would go on to develop a lot of the tactics that were used in psychological warfare during the war in Vietnam. Uh, among them famously is Operation Wandering Soul, where they tried to convince Vietnamese soldiers that there were ghosts in the jungle, and no, I'm not kidding. However, he wasn't directly involved with that operation. It was more so his influence in the departments he created, because at the time, he was the lead in Operation Mongoose. Operation Mongoose was the secret operation that didn't officially happen until they said it officially happened years later, like they always do, where Lansdale was officially tasked with killing Castro, or at least destroying the Cuban government by whatever means possible. After Lansdale's failure with this and things like the Bay of Pigs operation, he was officially fired from his position as head over CIA psychological warfare by the Kennedy administration, more specifically McNamara. However, he still maintained several ties to the CIA after this, and according to many theorists, was a part of the Kennedy assassination. Or if he wasn't directly one of the collaborators, at least knew about it. Which for a guy who's already faked a vampire attack and pretended to be God, I'm sure killing a president's like, a normal Tuesday for him. And with that, we have the end of the story of that time the CIA pretended to be vampires in order to take over the Philippines. See, I told you I wasn't lying. And remember, kids, the next time that somebody tells you the government wouldn't do that, oh yes, they would. Because if pretending to be vampires is something they're just willing to throw out there, think about the stuff they're not willing to tell us. And while I'll probably do longer videos in the future where I compile a lot of them, I read about this story and there was no way I couldn't talk about it immediately right now with no hesitation. So hopefully if you're still watching, you think it's at least half as cool as I know it is. And if you do, that's really cool. And I'm really glad you're here and you're really cool. And I just want to say thank you for watching. Thank you all so much for watching. Like I said, as the moment I heard about this story, I was like, I have to tell everyone right now immediately. And it's also a good introduction to spooky season. Me and my conspiracy theory have itself and vampires. Like what a, what a horrible connection. I love it. Um, but thank you all for watching this long. Uh, if you're curious about reading more into it, there's this fantastic book uh, by William Bloom called Killing Hope. U.S. military and CIA interventions since World War II. Um, he essentially, he's a journalist, who, or was a journalist, he's passed away now, but he went through all of the court records and declassified information and laid out all of the government's meddling post-World War II. Uh, and it's a fantastic book I'm working my way through. And he details all of this stuff, um, like very thoroughly, and it's a great read. And there's a lot more where this came from. I'll probably eventually make a video like giving a brief summary of all of them because uh, I think they're really cool. Also, you may know about William Bloom because he was considered a very controversial figure when in 2006, Osama bin Laden, during one of his broadcasts, recommended his book, Rogue State, A Guide to the World's Only Superpower, saying that it's a good uh, book against the American government. And whenever that happened, he had the best book sales he ever experienced, but was never asked to speak in any public events again. Because uh, he was, you know, obviously considered ostracized because Osama bin Laden spoke for him. Um, but he does make a lot of good summaries and compilations or made. I keep saying it. He's passed away now, but <laughs> he's still here in spirit. Um, no, but he made a lot of good summaries and compilations of like, not just conspiracy S stuff, but just shady stuff they've admitted to doing like the vampire attacks. Um, 
And like I said, there, there will be more of this <laughs> whenever I get done working my way through the book. So hopefully you enjoyed it because there's more to come. Uh, but for now, I want to say thank you all so much for the support you've shown me on the last video. Uh, after I botched the, fr I I'm so paranoid with stuff. After I mess something up, I'm like, that's it. That's the channel. That's all she wrote. Uh, and then I, I like messed up the Frankenstein upload, but then you guys are just as supportive as ever on a video about a black and white movie, again, that none of us were alive for. And that means a lot. So hopefully you enjoyed. I also want to mention that uh, Internet Historian, one of my favorite YouTubers of all time, made a video uh, on his main channel that I got to be the face and the voice of uh, the lead role. And that meant a lot. Internet Historian's always been one of my favorite channels. And it's weird to think like, Two of his videos ago, I started YouTube, and now I'm like front and center in one of his. It's just, it's a blessing. He's a great guy to work with. Um, so I'll link that video in the description because I think it's really cool and you all should check it out. Uh, and I, again, thanks, man, for putting me in that. It means the world. Um, but anyway, I believe that should do it for now. Uh, I believe we're at 1.84 million. Thank you all so much for that. It means the world. And I'm excited for spooky season. Got a lot of plans coming uh coming up ahead so stay tuned for that but for now i just want to say thank you for watching i hope that you enjoyed and i will see you in the next one bye